Okay. Thanks, Denise. Um, so I am Chase Hagen. I'm joined by my colleague. I'm Naomi Norman. And to get started, we are just really thrilled um, that the system um, would allow us to present on reacting. So we want to say a special thanks to Denise, to Maisie, and to Mark Johnson, to Ginger Durham uh, for letting us have this time to talk a little bit about reacting to the past. So uh, we thought what we would do in terms of spend our time this morning would take a look at both reacting uh, in its national presence as well as its institutional presence here at the University of Georgia, focusing in on many ways um, how role-playing pedagogies can deepen student learning and enhance faculty efficacy. So reacting to the past, as you can see here, is in many ways a student-centered active learning pedagogy built around uh, elaborate games written by faculty experts within their content or discipline, uh, disciplinary expertise and the games are written in a way to engage students and to have them really um, debating in substantive and research-based um, ways um, critical moments of conflict and contestation about ideas in the past in which students are assigned roles, they debate hugely important issues and ideas in the past, and we'll get to some of what these games are in a moment, so you'll see that it's far more detailed than just some moment in the past. Uh, the classes are handed over to students. They run those sessions themselves with the faculty member taking on the role of a game master uh, and decentering the classroom from the faculty member where instructors now advise, guide, and grade, um, but they're not at the front of the classroom lecturing. Reacting will draw students into, that, into the past, into a kind of critical moment, promoting engagement, improving their intellectual and academic skills along the way. We have found that it's in, in truly effective uh, pedagogy for active learning and for flipped classrooms, both large and small. Reacting began in the mid-90s. Uh, you see pictured here Mark Carnes, who's a historian up at Barnard College at Columbia University. Mark was, uh, like most of us, I think, uh, at least at times, struggling with, uh, so I've assigned these readings to my students and nobody seems to have done the reading. He could show up in class and say, okay, what do we think about document X? And the students kind of looked at him like, oh, you wanted us to actually read that. <laughs> um, and so out of that uh, kind of frustration and that challenge was born the idea of reacting to the past. How can we motivate students to do the reading and then do something with that reading to not only deepen the experience, but to deepen the learning around, again, Mark is a historian, but we'll talk a little bit about how reacting has expanded beyond the humanities in, in a moment. So what happens once you become a reacting faculty member? Well, um, there are now, as you see here, about 350 plus colleges and universities who have adopted the pedagogy faculty members at, at those colleges and institutions. Um, there are, I think, about 35 or maybe now 40 institutions that are part of the consortium that support reacting. It is centrally supported out of Barnard College, where Mark is uh, a faculty member. But if you join us uh, in our quest of reacting to the past, uh, you can see a number of resources detailed here, right? There are regional conferences and workshops, summer institutes, uh, the, the summer institute at uh, Barnard in New York, a slew of, again, regional conferences. We have one upcoming, and we'll provide those details with you. You can visit a reacting class uh, at another institution. We have a, a pretty open classroom policy among the uh, reacting faculty nationally and internationally. Um, contact the reacting staff, and all of these hyperlinks, Mark and uh, Naomi and I chatted earlier about being able to send this out so you can have all these active links to get you exactly on the page you need to be on the reacting site. Um, a game library, and it is password protected, so you'll have to request access into that game library of game books and instructor manuals, other resources. And it's password protected so that students can have access to all the secrets uh, that are necessary to make reacting work. A faculty lounge, and there's also a, uh, a wall there that you'll have to get through. Nothing too high, just if you can prove your identity as a faculty member at an institution. Uh, Reacting is also on Twitter, and there's a YouTube channel. We'll take a look at one of those videos from that channel in just a moment. So for every Reacting game, um, it's pretty typical that the things you see here uh, will be items that, that are central to making the game work. There's a student game book. 
Uh, we have a number of our published games now with W.W. Norton. Game books cost somewhere between $15 and about $22 per game book. Students, you would, the same way that you assign any other course reading, you send the ISBN number to your bookstore, or they could go on Amazon or wherever, buy the book, bring it to class. The instructor's manual, uh, the second kind of key element for a game that would be issued to you as a PDF um, within that game library once you decide to implement a game and you've made your way into the reacting community. There'll be companion te uh, texts, primary source readings that are included both within the student game book and suggested readings that you'll have access to and could provide on your learning management system uh, with no charge to students. As I say, there are published games. We'll take a look at those in a moment. And then there are also a kind of separate category of games and development. Um, and that, that list, which we in the reacting community call the big list of reacting games or the blorg, um, continues to expand, again, beyond the humanities into STEM areas and into foreign languages as well. Yeah, so um, reacting to the past has been um, present at UGA since the fall of 2003. Uh, we're very fortunate here that uh, when it was first introduced, um, our current president, Jerry Moorhead, was the director of the Honors College. He sort of came into contact by a faculty member with reacting, became very enthusiastic about the whole student-centered classroom, uh, active learning pedagogy, uh, the engagement uh, with big ideas, the, um, the development within students for critical thinking became a huge supporter of the pedagogy and remains a huge supporter of the pedagogy um, today. So we use reacting to the past in a variety of venues here at UGA. Uh, we embed them in, uh, we embed reacting games in classes, both lower division classes and upper division classes. Um, I've done it personally in our first year experience course, our first year odyssey. Uh, other faculty have done it in small honors courses. Uh, and we've even uh, recently introduced um, a reacting game into a large lecture class with about 120 students in it. Uh, that was, you know, that presented very individual specific challenges, but we were thrilled and excited to see that it works equally well in a very large lecture venue. And it, it provides a fantastic opportunity inside that big lecture venue for some small scale um, active learning. So um, I find that the thing I like most about reacting is that it is a remarkably flexible pedagogy. Um, you can find a way to make reacting work in just about any style classroom that you can imagine. And that big list of reacting games and development is in fact really big. Uh, and so with a certain amount of creativity, um, you can find a game that will fit in almost any uh, course uh, that you currently teach. And so that's the other great thing about it is, is its flexibility and uh, the wide kind of disciplinary range that it covers. Um, so it started at UGA over 10 years ago and it sort of stayed static for several years. Uh, the same sort of core of devoted reacting faculty kept on using react, you know, reacting and, and, and singing its praises, but it didn't get too much of a um, traction uh, amongst other faculty until we started this collaboration between the UGA Reacting Program and the UGA Center for Teaching and Learning. Uh, and it's that collaboration that's really spread reacting uh, to a lot of different colleges on campus, and we now have far more faculty using reacting now than, you know, than we've had before. So uh, the Center for Teaching and Learning sponsors faculty development workshops uh, that uh, talk to faculty about you know, using the pedagogy in their classrooms. Uh, two Mays ago, we sponsored a four-day intensive Midmaster Institute by invitation only, where we worked with about 15 different faculty on redesigning a course to embed a reacting game inside their course. We now have a reacting fellow. Uh, so we have a faculty member uh, who, as a result of that May Master workshop, uh, is now uh, using reacting in a number of his classes and helping us spread the word. And then here um, on campus, 
uh, we host every year a regional conference on reacting uh, where for um, two and a half days uh, we have faculty from, um, from UGA, from all over the state of Georgia and all over the region come uh, play um, an intensive two-day game uh, and uh, engage in some panel discussions and workshops talking about various ways you know, to use reacting. So uh, we just want to highlight that our institute is coming up April 1st through 3rd this year. Uh, you can link on that particular uh, website right there and get to the registration page. And uh, we really hope that we'll be able to welcome some of you um, to campus um, in a few weeks to uh, participate in a reacting conference. We find that really um, that's the best way to get familiar with the pedagogy is to come to a conference and to put yourselves in the seat of students and actually play a game for a couple of days. Okay, so what do these games look like? As we said earlier, the game topics um, and disciplines, in some ways, kind of growing out of the humanities, there seems to be often for faculty when we, when we talk about reacting, um, the idea that there's a natural fit, and perhaps it's a, it's a well kind of grounded assumption. There would be a natural fit for reacting to work within history or classics courses or other kind of humanities areas. And that is where, as you can see here, the published games by W.W. W. Norton that, that's kind of where we begin as a community. But very quickly, uh, through an NSF grant and through other kind of efforts, we began expanding out from uh, games in the humanities from the trial of Anne Hutchinson or the trial of Galileo or the threshold of democracy, Athens in 403 BCE, uh, games which run typically three to five weeks of gameplay um, to STEM games. And you see here a kind of description of these STEM games where the full length games, again, four or five weeks worth of gameplay with about a week of setup and maybe a day or two of post-mortem where you chat with students about what happened in the game. Was it in keeping with historical realities? Did we take a trip in, in, in an ahistorical direction? And what can we learn from that? Um, so we have three of those full length games within STEM. And then there are chapter length games. And what we mean by that, chapter length games are typically two days, maybe three, sometimes, again, as Naomi said, a really flexible pedagogy. In your classroom, what is written as a two day game, you could expand out to four days. You could take perhaps uh, two weeks of a Tuesday, Thursday, say, uh, schedule. And we found that expanding within the STEM disciplines invites um, a whole other area, right? A faculty expertise of kind of teaching styles into the reacting community. And that's been ongoing now, I think, from the early 2000s, the mid 2000s. It's, it's, it's truly been that expansion has really brief new um, and exciting kind of um, ways of seeing teaching and learning into the reacting community. Yeah, so, so we mentioned that uh, the best way to really sort of understand reacting is for you to go to a conference and to play a game in a conference setting. Uh, another really powerful thing to do is to kind of hear from students uh, about their reactions. By now we're in 1948, India is on the eve of independence. The British are pulling out, India is intensely divided. We had a mutiny, and then the communists tried to stage a few uprisings, so there's a lot up in the air. I think when people think of history, they kind of have this stereotypical idea that it's sitting and reading the textbook and just reading facts and dates. Whereas in reacting to the past, you're acting out history. I am Dr. Ambedkar. I'm the leader of the depressed class. My role in this game is the knees arm of Hyderabad. I'm the president of the Congress Party. I'm Nehru. Reacting to the past is a really fantastic and unique experience. It looks at history in a whole new way. You're not sitting there listening to a teacher lecture. You're not sitting there taking notes. It's not just memorizing dates and memorizing principles. You're embodying this character that you normally would just be reading in a textbook. It really throws you into the time period. And it's unlike any other class I've ever taken. It doesn't feel like school. We walk into class talking, friendly. You sit down, it's go time. You forget that you know, you're not actually in India in 1946. Everyone kind of wants to win at all costs. You have to do whatever it takes. 
beginning of the game, all the characters are thrown into this conference at Simla. The purpose of us all meeting is so that we can talk to the Governors General and say, this is what we want to happen in India, and this is what we're hoping you can do for us. I really came in knowing nothing about India other than that it was a British colony. I didn't know anything about it, all the debates, the partitioning, the characters. I really didn't know what to expect. The INC operates on a pragmatic level. We are striving and have been striving for a unified India since its conception. I will tell you something, INC. There is one way in which the minority groups are united. We do not want to be Hindu. Preparing for the role is sort of studying for the exam. You want to know as much as possible and you want to outread and outresearch everyone. That's why you learn the history so well in reacting, is because you have to go out and really do your homework. Otherwise, you're going to get crushed. And it makes you want to work outside of class and just invest as much time as possible in it. I never really lose interest in what's going on because it's so compelling <laughs> all the time. I'm never stressed in this class, but I'm always having fun. It's a wonderful, terrifying kind of investment that you find yourself having. They teach you how to build coalitions, how to work with people of competing ideologies, leadership skills, you know, public speaking. You have to understand things from all points of view. It's skills that you can really take with you in life. I think reacting to the past is more engaging than any other class I've taken because of the way that it puts the student in control. You can feel empowered and feel like you're making a difference. You really not only get to know the history better, but you get to know these people so much better than any other class I've taken. I've made, I think, my closest friends through this class. We finally got rid of the Governor's General, which is very exciting. There's no more British in India. So now we need a new leader of this new Indian Union. There's going to be speeches, and then we're going to take a vote. The Indian National Congress is here to finally put an end to the thought that this will be a government of intolerance to minority groups. With us in place, I can promise you that you will be secure from the misconduct of any extremist Hindu neighbors. Please, please bear that in mind when voting today and show your support to the Reservoir. Thank you. One thing this class has taught me is that it's very hard to learn history in retrospect. You really have to put yourself in the shoes of the people at that exact moment in history. You get really passionate about a topic that you never would have thought you would care about before. Now, like maybe when an event happens in India, I'll read it online or in the newspaper because I do have a connection now to it. Ten years from now, I'll probably remember more from this class than I will from half the other big lecture classes I've taken. I mean, I'm not a history person, but I still love it, and I think that it can really be an amazing experience for anyone. you can see that that's a very high energy classroom uh, and I can attest to the fact that that these are very high energy classrooms my favorite part of that particular video is the one shot you got of the professor in there uh, he was at the blackboard tallying votes and that's kind of what happens to instructors in a reacting classroom students really do take control uh, and are in control, and the professor really does very much recede to the background. You're busy, but you're not controlling the classroom. Okay, so with that, I think um, we're very happy to enter into a Q&A with those of you, uh, the 14 attendees, um, or anybody else kind of on the line. Um, I know Denise is still with us, so, and, and Mark. Um, any questions that anybody might have? If you have a question, you can raise your hand if you would like to use the microphone or you could put it into the chat bar, but while we're waiting for those. So one of the things I noticed in that video that was really cool is when the students were introducing themselves, they didn't say, I'm playing the role of so-and-so. They said, I am so-and-so. So they've obviously really, like they have, they, they take this seriously and they take on this role in a very personal way. But it also makes me wonder if there's a right student or group of students for this. Are there students who are more successful or I, I'm sure you, you see where I'm going with this question. 
Yeah, no, I think that's I think that's a great question, Denise, and and it gives me an opportunity to say that so that we're doing um, an ongoing study on kind of both assessment as well as student interaction, student perceptions of learning, and the impact that it's having that reacting is having on student learning as well as on faculty success. It's going to collect um, a number of experiences from about eight different institutions, sizes and types. Um, but I can speak from my own experience in having worked with Reacting, and, and Naomi certainly please share as well. But I think what's unique about Reacting is that if we if we take a look at the kind of research on social cohesion, and we take a look at the research on relationship-driven teaching and the impact that that can have, what I think that Naomi and I both have seen is that. Reacting is pretty unique in that it allows students to kind of divorce themselves from the contemporary, right? And then even for introverted students or for students who feel like their voice might not be as valuable, right? Even, though, even if they've read the documents and they've made sense of it and they've contextualized it within the course's content, they may still feel like they don't want to take the risk, right? They don't want to jump out there as themselves into a class discussion, let's say. But within reacting, you're absolutely right, Denise. They take on that role, and in many ways, it's liberating, right? Because it's not their own self that's at risk. I mean, there's some of that for sure, but they're far more willing, you know, to, to stick their neck out on the line, pardon the pun, if they're, you know, the king of France in the revolution, um, rather than a student who is reading about, let's say, class relations on the eve of the French Revolution, and they're supposed to be trying to synthesize what scholars have said about class and politics. Does that make sense? It does, thank you. What about, so that, that makes perfect sense, and I love that it gives students um, almost a, I don't know, it, it gives them a role that they can step out of their own selves and, and be someone else. But what about, in terms of first years versus, um, you know, senior seminars, is, you know, does, does that make a difference? Uh, well, I routinely teach it in our first year experience class, and um, it's very effective. Uh, and I have found that it's equally effective with first year students and with seniors in an advanced seminar. And in some respects, it works even better for first year students because they're already in a transitional phase, and they're already kind of exploring, uh, you know, a, a brand new environment, and they're trying to figure out their place in this brand new environment, and they're they're nervous, and sometimes they're very afraid, uh, and this does give them quite a bit of liberty uh, to actually speak up uh, and to learn to develop the kind of persona that they want to have in class, where they're really an active participant in class. So I don't think it's really, um, a, you know, sort of better suited for, for one level of class than for another level of class. The other thing I would add to, to what Chase said before, um, just on a kind of anecdotal level, is that one of the things that I've noticed in a reacting classroom, especially when I embed it in another class, is that students who are very, 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 very quiet, uh, and you wonder if they're ever gonna say anything, I would put them in a reacting, you know, environment, and I would give them a strong role, and I was frequently shocked at how they rose to meet the bar, uh, and they really sort of blossomed once they had that role that they could assume. And if, and if I can add to that really quickly, um, Denise, because I think that kind of hearkening back to the notion of the flexibility of the pedagogy, just for, you know, folks who, who might be looking at reacting for the first time. I mean, so within that instructor's manual, there are, there are a couple of different ways that you can turn off or turn on different elements or different themes, depending on what you're trying to focus on within your course. And so I think that, that, that in some ways lends itself to being able to adjust, right, the game and use it in the ways that you want to use it, shorten it or lengthen the gameplay, uh, emphasize, let's say, gender as opposed to class or elements if you're, you know, you have a course on the evolution of race in America. I mean, you might want to downplay other elements within, say, the Frederick Douglass game and upplay others or in some ways create some silences in there. And I think that that gets at kind of your question of, designing uh, the course in a way and using or embedding reacting 
in a way that helps you achieve kind of clearly defined course objectives and course goals. Jason and Naomi, we have a question from Steve Jones asking if you could provide some additional examples of disciplines outside of the humanities that have successfully used RTTP. And I guess I would expand on that to say, could you give us some kind of an example? I mean, it's pretty easy to, to see how we would use this in, in history, but in okay, well, we've got other... a great example. Uh, we have a woman in vet med uh, who teaches for, for undergraduates a large lecture class, 120 students in infectious diseases. So she actually uh, played the cholera game with her class, uh, which is one of the STEM games, uh, and a class on infectious diseases, uh, the cholera game was in fact a perfect match. So not only was she doing it in a discipline that you might not normally associate with reacting, but she also was doing it in a venue, a large lecture class that presented some challenges. Uh, so one of the things she decided to do since she was already flipping her class in general, and she was already involved in uh, adopting a lot of active learning uh, techniques. She already had the students uh, separated up and doing a lot of group work. So instead of giving an individual role to an individual student, she gave an individual role to an entire group of students. So students who had already been working together in group, they then took on the identity of a figure inside the cholera 1854 game in London uh, and played the reacting game inside that large lecture venue with a real scientific perspective. So they assumed the role of people that were addressing cholera exactly. at that time. Exactly. Um, so, go ahead, Mark. Then it does uh, amount to it's a historical look, okay, I, that makes sense. That's right, yeah, but I think within any of our disciplines, say from physics to genetics to geography uh, to food science and technology, we got a couple of more examples. Like, if you think about it, all of our disciplines have a history of that discipline, and um, I think what's really, really interesting about that, so, so for within geography, we had somebody use a climate change in 2009 game, right? And so we had students um, serving as kind of like nations within the UN trying to resolve the crisis, right? Which is a, it, it's a moment of conflict set in the past. Um, and it provides this kind of historical pers perspective on an issue of science, right? We had some, another faculty member in food science and technology um, who used the USDA food pyramid, right? So the history of ways in which we understand the use of food and how, you know, the government relation with our individual lives around uh, how we use and eat uh, food. Great. You know what the thing about the student blossoming reminded me of when we first started working on ECOR and I had a, a uh, professor that taught English and she had a student in class that never said anything face to face, but then when they were online, um, they blossomed and it was, it, it seemed to be a social distance thing. Or, and it reminds me that if this student could take on a role, then they felt more comfortable than when they were themselves in the class. I think that's exactly right. Uh, we got a thank you from Steve, a uh, nursing faculty who's used the collar game and a mass communication professor who's developed their own game related to broadcast journalism. So oh, That's great. And so we have a, um, maybe time, well, we're kind of out of time, but we have one more question, which is, can you say a little bit more about what happens if a game goes in a way that isn't historical? Do students in the long term remember the right or the wrong? Uh, well, uh, a critical part of a reacting game is the postmortem, where you have one or two days when the game is over and the faculty member kind of comes back to the center of the classroom and engages the class in a broad discussion of what happened in the reacting game and then what happened historically speaking. So you've got this very important moment at the very end once kind of, you know, the emotions have quieted down a little bit where you can actually talk about uh, historical reality uh, and students then can really understand the notion of uh, contingency and agency 
uh, and that all of the so-called historical facts, uh, they're all dependent upon agency and contingency, and they learn that lesson much more effectively through reacting than you standing in front of the classroom and talking about agency and contingency. And you do have this corrective moment inside the postmortem. Yeah, and I think the comparison of that is, is truly, I mean, there are a lot of powerful and meaningful moments throughout a reacting game as, as I've used it. And I think the same is true for anybody who's used reacting. Um, but one of those, one of the most powerful moments, I think, is in that postmortem where you ask students, where you ask them to kind of share out of their roles, what were your kind of hidden objectives? Or, or can you tell everyone now why you made the choices that you made, right? And then how would that compare to someone of a similar kind of status in the past? Or how did they react to it? And how did your reactions look differently and steer the game in a very different direction? So in some ways, it's, it's, it's better when the game kind of jump, right. jumps off the historical track. That's great. That's really cool. Um, well, I want to thank you guys so much for sharing this fascinating and obviously very powerful pedagogy with us. Um, you guys saw shared the conference that's coming up at UGA and the website for Barnard College um, reacting to the past. So for folks who are interested in learning more, hopefully you've got some resources going forward.